Greetings, our relatives and our people. We're so happy to start the very first Nehijih, Our Voices and Indigenous Solutions podcast. Uh, I've been dreaming about this for about half a year, and I'm really, really excited that it's finally coming to fruition. And I really could not imagine a better first episode than to have uh, my relatives here with me. Uh, I wanted it to be all Dene people to start um, because I wanted to honor my homelands and my people and the elders and matriarchs of our community. Um, and I'm just really, really excited that uh, I have with me here Carlos Baca of I Collective and other amazing uh, indigenous food sovereignty groups and projects that he does. Uh, Hazel James, uh, who's one of our elders and has taught us a lot and always been there with us through thick and thin to support our, our projects and our prayers as, as youth. And the, the one and only Janine Yazi, uh, amazing advocate for MMIW, uh, organizing so many beautiful things in our community, uh, working with her husband Kern to do amazing grassroots work in the Gallup area, Lupton area. It's just a huge honor to have all three of you here. And uh, yeah, this is the first podcast. We're gonna look at the I Collective's new cookbook. We're so excited to talk about it, A Gathering Basket, which is a multimedia cookbook. It's online and it's much more than just a cookbook. Hazel James is gonna give us some insights about you know, how to be connected to our foods in the right way, and Janine's going to share her thoughts on all of this and the importance of matriarchy in our communities and in the world. And this podcast is really meant to focus on solutions, ways that we can actually create change in our communities. We all know the problems. We eat, sleep, and breathe them every day as Indigenous peoples. And this podcast, we really wanted to showcase solutions. So, Ikhyahat and Sago, thank you all three for being here. Um, I want to start with you, Carlos, if that's okay. Can you please tell us uh, a little bit about this really exciting project you have of this new online cookbook? And also tell us, you know, what were you hoping to achieve by publishing this cookbook? Yeah, definitely. Um, first, let me start by saying thank you. Uh, it's always an honor to be surrounded by matriarchs. Um, your where where does men get our strength from for this work and most of these teachings? So thank you for having me here. Um, so a gathering basket was actually conceived, I think, in 2017. Uh, we're in uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Just got done doing an event. It was like three in the morning. Um, we we're all on a cool down period, <laughs> trying to. You know, we just had like an entire week of events there. And uh, it was really like talking about the lack of, of not necessarily the lack of indigenous chefs and, and food stuff, because it, it's pretty, pretty vast in this, this time. But um, all of those applications of that knowledge all come through a Western sphere, right? They all come through a white publisher and a white editor and typically have a white writer and they're representative of an individual, you know, a business, you know, they're not, uh, they're not an actual space for community to speak, right? And, and I've always been a, a big proponent of the fact that if we're if we're doing this work and our communities aren't coming with us, if we're not bringing our youth with us, and if we're not taking the, the words of our elders into consideration as we do this work, that we're not doing it right. You know, and uh, so in that time, the seed was was really planted and, and it's taken, you know, this time to germinate and time for, you know, for that caretaking of organizations to really get to a space where uh, we felt that we could, you know, I guess just make that offering, you know. And so uh, a gathering basket, like you said, it's a multimedia uh, cookbook. It's a, it's a whole experience. It's not 
It's not something you go purchase at the store and it sits on your bookshelf, right? It's, um, it's recipes, um, both pre-colonial and modern. Um, it really talks about, uh, I mean, just like as a piece of the the intro of it states that, you know, like is a recipe, right? Is it temperature and time and uh, this many cups and a teaspoon of this? Or is it the place that you come from, right? Is it part of your cosmology? Is it ever changing like our people, Right. And those are the two things that, that really, that, that, I mean, just that simple statement shows you how different we operate in the world, right? And so with that being said, it's like we have to look towards who's, who's doing the work, most importantly, because even though, you know, my face and others in the I Collective, you know, Brian Yazi, Naftali Duran, Christina Stanley Bear Reed, you know, a little Echo Hawk. This, there's like, you know, they've been in all the magazines, been on all the shows, we've been on all the stuff. But that's also part of the Western paradigm, right? That's all part of the, the patriarchal system that has an agenda to, to maneuver our stories, right? And um, this is a place where we get to tell our own stories. We get to tell our own histories. And it's not, uh, I can't always have been explaining it like this is, um, the I Collective is a, a conduit for these conversations. Um, the interviews that I'm doing, because I'm, I'm writing the book, um, but I'm not, I'm not the, the voice, right? Like my voice is interspersed in there, but uh, we'll say like this, this first issue, um, if you were to get it, there's, uh, like there's a language video proponent, right? So we use three leaf sumac. And so in that there's, uh, the Diné, the Ute, the Hopi, the Apache, all these different words, right? For the, for this plant. And cause we really want to like, you know, navigate also the way that, we're we're viewed as a monolith and we're viewed in um you know that pan-indian ideology and like no like just here in the four corners there's like 18 or 19 words for that relative right and so like how do we break that barrier you know and so like with that language video that's that um there's cooking videos there's webinars attached to it. Um, and there's also something that's fundamentally missing from all cookbooks is the fact that uh, those books come from a place of privilege, right? And so because my the, the first recipe that we're working on is uh, chilchin, yucca, and chiltepin chili, and it's just a popsicle. It's really simple, right? So three, three ingredients, maybe a pinch of salt and some water if you, if you wanted to add a little salt in there. But other than that, that's all there is, right? And that's great because I can go forage that stuff, right? I can go do that. But not everybody has that information. And not everybody that's reading this book is in the Southwest either. So in that, there's like this, this space that holds like, okay, well, if you're in the Great Lakes, you have this that's similar. If you're on the East Coast, there's this that's similar. Also, if you don't know what I'm talking about, all you got to do is go to the spice aisle in your local store. And every single thing I'm talking about comes in a jar for a couple bucks, right? And so, you know, it, 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 and it's like that kind of offering um, isn't something that we see in like the, the bougie chef world, right? Because in the chef world, it's about who's on top. It's about that, that patriarchal system and being the face of it. Right. And the, those, uh, other cookbooks in the, in the, even within the indigenous sphere that way. And so 
you know, looking looking into that that model, we speak of like Chilchen, we speak of that three leaf sumac in the context of environmental racism and how something that I learned about that was, you know, so precious to our people and and the the way I was taught about it and how in the Animus River Valley back in the day the the women would have different camps up and down the valley. And as they would go down harvesting, they would all sing and their songs would connect. They said that you could hear them all the way into New Mexico as so many people gathered along the river. And then as I started studying in the, in the Western sphere, um, Western ethnobotany, I learned that they called them squawberries. You know, and, and, and in that moment, I was like, oh, that really hurts, you know. You know, I mean, and of course we can have a, you know, mass, there's been mass debates for 40 years about the terminology of squaw, but you know, the reality is that it's been uh, weaponized against our indigenous women, right? And so looking at it through that lens and having that conversation uh, versus this is just an ingredient. Um, with yucca, we talk about um, uh, traditional ecological knowledge in general, just uh, the, you know, yucca is probably the plant you want to know about if you're in the desert, right? As a food source, as a soap source, if if you need to make shoes, if you need to make a basket, if it doesn't matter, it's like the the go-to plant. And uh, so there's that conversation. And then for the Chiltepin, we talk about uh, indigenous agriculture and the, the historical context of the fact that the Chiltepin chili, which grows everywhere in like the Northern Sonora and all the way up into Arizona, Texas, and California, is the genetic grandmother of all chilies in this hemisphere. And so you have to look into like thousands of years of indigenous agriculture to get the chilies you see in around the globe, right? And those are like the indigenous contribution. Uh, I mean, even those, those, those relatives were stolen and, you know, their, their journey has been a part of the story of colonialism. Um, it doesn't get told through that lens. Right. And so we have this opportunity to, to, you know, use our platform and to use the 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 Western fame, I guess you would say, to really just give voice to to our own stuff. Right. And like there's a reason that we're doing it all ourselves. Right? There's no there's no other hands other than indigenous in our project. The artwork, the poetry. You know, doesn't matter what it is. It's all it's all coming through us. So there's no uh, I don't have to worry about a white editor in some boardroom saying, no, nah, we're not going to publish that. Like, no, this is too controversial. No, we, we don't want to hear that. That's not what we're selling. Right. And so that's where we are with it. And, uh, you know, just uh, for the listeners, uh, they might find interest in it. Um, you know, that was the. The first issue, the second issue is going to be on the uh, treaty right fights for the during the walleye wars in the Great Lakes um, and, and really telling that history from the perspective of people that were there. And the walleye is a kind of fish, right? Yeah, the walleye is a type okay, of Okay, I don't know fish. I'm a desert Indian, so I don't know. All oh, of that. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm with you. I go every, every time I go up there, everybody's trying to give me fish. I'm like, um, <laughs> I love you. I'll find somebody that would love to eat this, you know, but, uh, you know, so looking at treaty rights and then, uh, we're looking at like the rebirth of indigenous birth work and first foods. in one of the issues we're looking at, uh, rematriation. And not just rematriation through the lens of of seed and 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 food ways, but also the rematriation of indigeneity. And what does that look like, right? And so, uh, and then we're looking at something just just I think the the last issue for this year is on mushrooms and indigenous use of mushrooms, um, which are really really varied from taboo. You know, here here where I. Uh, where I was born and raised here at, over here by Southern Ute, you know, it's uh, for the Ute people, it's a, uh, it's a taboo food, right? It's not something you eat. It's considered uh, 
the English translation comes into like ghost house or spirit house, right? And so it has like a whole other space versus uh, like the Inuit and up like through Alaska where they 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 use a one of the birch polypore mushrooms. Uh, they they use it as a like we do with um, juniper ash, right? Like they burn it down into this ash, except for they mix it with their tobacco, you know? And it's like this really, really important thing to them that they even have like medicine pouches and little medicine boxes that they, uh, they use, right? So there's a lot of context and a lot of conversations to have in there as well. So um, that being said, I appreciate uh, y'all listening to me. <laughs> and uh, I know we got, we have time constraints. So I'll go ahead and pass the mic. Yeah, that was Carlos Baca, Tewa, Nooch, and Dene, uh, chef, but also so much more. I've had the joy of going harvesting with you. And that's one of the things I've always really uh, loved about your work, brother, is that you really go out to Mother Earth, Nehemiah Nahasa, and go out and you get those ingredients and you give her offerings and you talk to her and you smell the air, like as you're gathering these ingredients, um, and I remember the first time I actually came across your work was on YouTube. It was some video about your some kind of chef thing or whatever. And and I was like, wow, this guy goes out and gathers his ingredients. And I actually cried because it was so beautiful because I think that's what so many of us, not just indigenous peoples, but every human being uh, is aching for is being connected to our foods directly again, because how many of us how much of our food do we have a direct uh, part in actually gathering from its source or how much of our food is just bought from the grocery store, or the drive through window or whatever. And I think that's an ache that so many of us feel. Um, and I really appreciate um, your talking about like community versus individualistic stuff. I feel like this podcast right here, this episode is a, is a, is an example of that because we could have just, interviewed you, you know, Carlos and, or just Janine or just Hazel. But I really think that if you look at indigenous music, um, indigenous um, uh, agriculture, indigenous, everything, it's always, we move together. Um, we, we go together. There's not like one star, or one, whatever. And that's really what I'm hoping to do with this podcast is you know, give each of the interviewees a chance to bring in other people so that it's not about any one of us, but it's about the message that we're giving. Um, and I'm really excited about the indigenous use of mushrooms because I was reading a paper for my PhD recently about um, how fire was applied. Indigenous fire in Mexico was applied to certain bioregions to stimulate uh, certain mushrooms to grow that they use for their foods. So uh, me, I don't know. I don't know too much about mushrooms. I've always kind of not known what the heck to do with them, but, um, I think they're obviously really important relatives and they keep everything going. We're really excited about the new cookbook. It just came out. If you go to iCollective.org, um, oh no, iCollectiveInc.org. It's all on there and it's beautiful. There's videos and like he said, recipes, but also histories, you know, how, how did these foods come to be? How were they taken away? Uh, what is the role of colonization and decolonization in indigenous foods? So please check it out. And there's an issue coming out every month, is it? Or every, every new moon? Is that kind of how y'all have it set up? Yeah, we're dropping every new moon. I think because we have five issues that we need to drop by the end of the year. Um, I believe November will have a double drop. Awesome. Blue moon. <laughs> cool. Um, Shema, Hazel, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we just appreciate you You always rolling with us. I remember, you know, not too long ago, we were at the base of Sisnajene, our Eastern Sacred Mountain, and you came to pray with us as youth as we did our, our um, traditional knowledge school. And I really appreciated you coming with us. Um, and I know you wanted to talk a little bit about foods from your perspective um, or anything else you want to share. So please feel free if you would like to. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Thank you very much for um, allowing me to, to say a few words as well and, and to share the wonderful uh, the wonderful myths about being Dine and, and, and living in the holy way in, the, in the, what we call Rajon. And every day as a grandmother and as a mother, we seek Rajon. And by doing that, you go out in the morning and you pray for yourself and your family and your relatives and the earth and the, all the sacred elements. And then they, they know you and they, they get to know you. And so um, presenting yourself in the dawn and then the evening twilight is really important uh, as a Dene woman and, and a teacher. Uh, as a Dene woman, uh, your responsibility is to mentor and to train and to talk about these uh, certain ways of uh, staying balanced uh, in Hojon. And now as a matriarch, as a, as a grandma, I take care of my land here. I take care of my seeds. I take care of the, 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 the surrounding that I want to make it comfortable for my family and my relatives when they come to visit. You know, and I, I want to, I want to um, show that the holy people that you know we can live in a in a good way and, and respect the way that we were taught to take care of things in a proper way and, and how to handle tobacco, how to handle your cut of thing, how to put things away in a proper way, how to fold your things. You just don't throw things, you know, into a cupboard and then close it. You have to really have a really uh, a process in your mind and your thinking when you handle these sacred things that's going to be the future for your children, your grandchildren. So those things are really important for as young people, you have to seek to learn those for yourself, ask questions, um, uh, to find someone that you can ask a question to. No question is a, is a bad question. No question is, in, is, 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 is embarrassing. It's real life questions that you have in your heart that you want to learn, you want to know. And um, one of the things that I just wanted to bring forth about is the meaning of love. Uh, as a mother, we have love for our, our relatives and our children, our land. And then we also say, I love you. But in the English setting, the Western setting, those are just three words, I love you. But in the Dene way, the Dene feelings that come with that, when you say, are you a ninch? A yo means a lot of love. A yo means a lot, lots and lots and lots. I mean, and love. That's how it says. The bottom word is a yo and mean, and it's like almost saying, "I love you from the bottom of my heart. I love you that much." A yo and mean, that that yo and mean, man. I love you for the full existence of myself. If you're going to translate that from Dene uh, into English, a yoninshne is a really educational word that our, our young people really need to learn that word and that they use that in their prayer. A yoninshne, shita, you know, my, my, my holy people, my son, uh, the sun, the sunrise, the sundown. Dom is a yoninshne, be with me. You're my child, I'm your child. And so, so those kind of exchange with their sacred elements is really important. As, they, as long as you know about the sacred elements and how you speak to it, they will, they will accept you and they will know you as your child. But if you, don't, if you don't recognize it and you don't understand it, I mean, if you don't recognize them or you don't acknowledge them, and using their own sake, that their, their sacred name, then they they don't know you too. So that's why it's really important. The communications with the elements is one of the things too. And um, as far as also matriarch, 
you know, is a, like I mentioned, the seeds in, in, in growing um, uh, the agricultural component of our life. And there's, um, there's uh, four different types of farms that we have in our, in our Denewe. And, um, and those are the different things that, the different ways to farm and do agriculture. And those things are important to know too. So if you know someone, you can ask um, about those certain ways of farming um, and, 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 and growing corn. And then the, the, the four corns, you know, the sacred corn, uh, how do you handle those? They represent male, female, they represent children, they represent elders. And so those uh, different form of uh, corns of color, white, um, uh, blue corn, and yellow corn, and then the corn of all colors, and they go in the four directions. And so those things are really important for young people to know. And then the center of earth, the center of the universe, and, and to order for one to achieve um, uh, achieve the uh, and balance is to know the universe, to know about the stars, to know about the linear cycles, to learn about the, the, the holiness about, about uh, our grandmother, the moon. And, and those things are really important in life. And as long as you know the the way that the stars move and in the name of the stars and the star systems and the galaxies and in the Milky Way, those are really important to us here on Earth. And we need to learn to use that as we move forward in life. And that keeps us balanced. And so if you can understand that, that way of life, and that way of being and being, being kind and gentle and compassion with everything around you and your surroundings, then you can really have a good life. And so uh, those are just some of the few things I would like to talk, touch upon regarding the matriarchal way. And then the, also the learning of the food systems. Um, I can give a really short story about our elders from Big Mountain, um, the bird of black goat and Pauline White Senior, Alice and Molly, uh, the grandmothers I, I, I really had the opportunity of working with back in the 70s during the longest walk, 1978. And we said, we're going to Washington DC to join the longest walk. And we packed up our U-Hauls, we took five U-Hauls out there to, to different directions that we brought our elders from. But I tell you, they had gunny sacks of, um, of dry um, uh, Danette pumpkins and they were swirl and swirl and swirl and swirl you know, packed into um, gummy sacks. Then they had thin layers of mutton um, sliced up jerky, and they had deer sliced up deer jerky. And then they had different herbs, just big bunches of herbs all tied up. And we had to put it tied up in the u haul like just like that, because they didn't want it to get all, you know, Punched up in a gunny sack or something, you know, and we all had to be careful around those herbs because that was going to be the herbs that were going to be our medicine along the way. If anybody got sick, got a cut, or had a nightmare or whatever, you know, you have to really be ready to be prepared and quick to have your own, um, your own medicine with you. And we had medicine men, medicine women praying for us every morning. And and everything that took place during back then, it all had to do with food. We survived and we didn't have enough money to go around to be buying 50 cars, caravan of people. And, and that's why the grandmothers came totally prepared and they had their, they rolled up their, their sheepskin and their blankets had it all tied up and had their little star or their little sheep drawn on it so that they know which one is theirs. And they would all be piled up with sheepskin and blankets and tents. But um, now that's a real a matriarchal way of teaching is what they did on that trip to Washington, D.C. And when we got to Washington, D.C., they, they didn't... You know, didn't put on their, their finest jewelry or anything. 
they still look like they're out herding sheep. So I had their te old tennis shoes on, their the, the skirt that they came in, whatever. But they they went to every congressman's office with their hair scarves and their tennis shoes, and they demanded. They demanded their treaty rights. They demanded their water rights. And they demanded, demand to be free from relocation. And the, the furthest priority that we had, the, top, the top, top priority for that walk was to protect our treaty rights because they were going to abrogate all 500 tre treaties with the uh, to indigenous nations here in, in the U.S. And we saved the treaties along with all the other tribes that were there that were beautiful. And so as a young person, you have to actually put yourself out there and actually decide that you're going to help your people, then you get out there and you do it. You don't worry about who your, what your peers are doing. You have to find it in your own heart to do that work. And then you have to find a way to keep protection for yourself for your family so those are real teachings and they're just not anything i just put it in a nutshell i wish i could say more about the food systems but it's really important that you learn to take care of that the squash and the meat and the herbs because they all go into your food they all mix in there and a good tasting take a good taste of food and don't be afraid of it, but learn how to use it and handle it. And it'll teach you really good things, and then you get good dreams, too. I have good dreams. And so I, I just wanted to share that part of it. I don't know if it's what we want to uh, talk about, but uh, I'll stop here. And I'll, yeah, thank you for giving me the time, Shachi. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's a uh... It's a great honor to hear the various things you have to teach us and to hear some of the stories like about the longest walk in 1978. Uh, and I didn't realize that they had such a, a, a watershed moment of saving all those treaties. Um, so there's so much wisdom in everything you just shared. And I really appreciate you sharing it with us and all the listeners. Um, and we especially want these teachings to support Diné youth and other other nations, other tribes that might be listening to this too, and uh, non-native folks too who might be listening to this to to take in these words and um, use them to improve themselves and their communities. Um, so um, thank you. It was very beautiful. And uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I just remember about puberty. That's really important, the puberty ceremony for women and men, young men. Hey, hey, that's, that's, that's the driving force is that puberty ceremony. If they're going to be a, a nice young lady and a nice young man that are going to grow up to become leaders for their communities. And, and a lot of our people are missing out on that puberty ceremony, not not some of them are probably not by choice because of the pandemic that we're in right now. A lot of them are probably not having it, uh, but they can personally have uh, a mini one at home that they have to observe uh, while they're home. And um, uh, but uh, for the women, uh, puberty, uh, the way they describe it is 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 when the when they have the moon the 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 puberty arrives and the blood the, the blood comes out of the body and those are considered uh, baby, baby aches your children that come through your body they're, and they're not they're never gonna live to see the world and that is why it's so sacred that you can't you can't attend ceremonies because you just lost you know that part of the blood because your body has to stay clean to, to actually um, make a baby and so that's why when women had their period they used to stay in a separate home until it's until they're done with it 
and then they can come back and join the family. But then there's an herb out there. It's called cheetah cornish. Then the women wear that thing. They wear it on their skirt. They have it in their pouch. So when they get uh, they get their monthly, they they take out that pouch and then they they um they give it to the little ones. If there's little kids running around, then they they all have to you know take of it themselves. Not her giving it to them, but not. the little ones do it themselves. They take it and they they take that medicine. That way. The mother can stay in the house. She don't have to leave the house for until it's till the period is over. That's to keep the the cleansing, uh, the clean minds and the spirit of those young children that are in the house, even the elders. So that's why they that puberty for women is really important on how to take care of themselves during that time. And then for the young men, you know, when they have that deep voice come in, that's a time that they need to have their ceremony because what that deep voice is there for is that they're ready to become a leader. And to become a leader, you have to have a good, strong voice. And then that's where they, they, they pray for his, his vocal and that his vocal is going to be the, the spirit of teaching, teaching what we need to know as people. That's what they pray for, for that puberty for young men. And the young women is all the cooking tools. The cooking tools are for to prevent poverty, to prevent hunger, that we're going to always have plenty. That's why when they cook with it, they pray with it. And that every, every single food that's prepared is prayed for. And, and so that tastes good and people use it. So that's so just some of the strong teachings of the, of the young people. And they need to learn those things and ask their grandma and grandpa and their mom and dad. So hopefully one of these days we can do more of that kind of teaching through the podcast. The hat. When I was having my kinasta when I was 14, we needed the, the corn for the cake to make the corn cake. And, oh, we were searching high and low. And and it was a, a masane, you know, one of our... Uh, uh, female elders who who went into her storage room and gave us several sacks of of dried whole corn kernels so that my kinasta could could happen. So you know it's exactly what you said, like with those sanis, you know, like um, ha- carrying all their foods and their uh, herbs in the U-Hauls to the longest walk that they came prepared. You know that at the end of the day, it was a woman, one of our elder women who had the 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 foods that I needed to to do my ceremony or else we might not have had it in a good way. So um the 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 puberty ceremony is so important and so many people have lost it. Uh, as Diné people we are lucky to to remember how to do the womanhood ceremony, how to do the manhood ceremony. So many of our relatives here on this continent, whether they mm-hmm. descend from Africa or they descend from Europe or Asia, or anywhere else, they don't have their ceremonies. And so what I was told by the elders is to bring a ceremony that anybody could use. So please, no matter who you are listening to this, when your daughter gets her first moon cycle, or when your son's voice starts to crack, do something for them. Even if you have to make it up, do something that honors them, that witnesses them, that sees that they're now making that journey from child to adult so that they never have to question if they really are who they are. That's part of what it's for, I think. So we're going to transition here to Janine Yazi, uh, another Diné uh, sister who's done so much for our communities. I can't even begin to uh, <laughs> read her bio, but it's it's so long. And I just appreciate the way you are, you know, keeping the home fires burning in, in our homelands outside of Gallup and really fighting for our people on a daily basis, representing us at the UN often, and really um, being boots on the ground every day with your beautiful children and your beautiful husband. So just really honored to have you here. And what would you like to say about Indigenous solutions and, and ways in which you know we can offer the world some solutions to help them and their communities? Oh, yat e do to echo what Carlos said. It's such an honor and a privilege to be 
with such beautiful, wise relatives um, on this podcast. And, you know, everything that Carlos and Hazel have spoken about um, is really about rematriation. And I know Carlos said that specifically. And I think for our non-Indigenous relatives, it's really important to help define what that means, um, even though we were given several examples just through Hazel's sharing of what it looks like for our communities. Um, it's best to start from a place that is common in, in terms of understanding in the Western world, and that's uh, repatriation which is uh, literally defined as a return to land. But when you look at the root of that word, um, it's about um, patriarchy. It's about the ruling father. Um, and so it really means literally, and even in a legal sense, returning to the land of your ruling for forefathers. <laughs> and rematriation is um, really the indigenous resistance uh, against those power structures and systems that are created off of that understanding that our natural world is, is nothing but a resource to be dominated and claimed and, and um, ruled over. And um, with rematriation, what we're talking about is a return to these sacred ways, to a sacred way of life that centers our and restores our responsibility and our relationship with all of our elements and our mother earth. Um, you know, I started uh, my work in my community, really just uh, trying to find out what is my role as a, a young indigenous woman with a semi fancy education, um, which really was kind of useless when I came to really helping my people um, navigate the challenges that our communities are facing and the multiple front lines that we're fighting on. Um, and so when I helped co-found the Little Colorado River Watershed Chapters Association, we really took a community-based approach over restoring our decision-making processes and our traditional governance structures over um, managing and stewarding our natural resources because it's a right and, and that is given to our people, not only all through the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but also through our own tribal laws. But um, we're, we're, we're living in a society that um, consistently and effectively disconnects people from these connections, from these values, and from these understandings. And so uh, it, it was really hard for our communities to really imagine what that looks like. And um, we, we did a lot of work visioning and um, remembering who we are as Diné people and what those responsibilities are in order to break out of those conditions, in order to think outside Robert rules of order and how do we have these conversations and, or, and thinking outside of like fiscal years and how to develop a strategic plan to really get to the heart of what it is that our people really need and really desire and want in order to restore wellness and, and beauty and health in our communities. And it didn't matter when we were able to finally get to that point in conversations, it didn't matter people's political affiliations, religious affiliations, education levels, occupations, whatever it was, it didn't matter because people all agreed that what they wanted most was, was clean air, clean water, a good life good opportunity, a sense of purpose for their young ones, uh, prosperity and well-being for the, the those that have yet to be born, uh, for restoration of our traditional ways that, that had us living in, as healthy communities that were in balance with our, with our environment, that took responsibility for our, our relationship and our interconnection with all of sacred beings and all of sacred life that surrounded us, because that gives you such great meaning. You know, like it's like the difference between um, teaching teaching our young people that they have to grow up and get a job and teaching our young people that they're sacred beings here to discover their purpose and their connection to all of all that's around us, their connection to the stars and their connection to the soil underneath their feet. That's real love. You know, like that's the love we're talking about and that Hazel was describing in her in her presentation. Um, and so in 2016, um, when we, um, I, I, my, my business, Six World Solutions, worked with the Shiprock Traditional Farmers and International Indian Treaty Council 
to host a food sovereignty gathering on traditional knowledge and climate change resiliency and shiprock. And part of the gathering was bringing together traditional knowledge holders that could teach people about how to do everything from harvesting our traditional foods to preparing them into our traditional meals. And every single presenter of, on, on the food side was uh, a Dene Astan, who was a matriarch, was a woman. Um, we had we had our young men there too, uh, te teaching different skills from weaving um, to to how to um, do watershed management and whatnot. Um, but it was all the Dene Astan that were teaching how to prepare the foods, and like we created a recipe book just for just for the the, the people. Um, in our local communities um, that I want to share with you, Carlos. It's this, it's really short and really small, but um, it, it, what you were saying reminded me of that because it wasn't like recipes, like this this structured, dictated like instruction of like what to do, right? It wasn't a linear process either, um, but it was really like about like you know this question, like these 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 um, instructions of encouragement of like, like find your confidence you know, be in good thoughts, be in prayer, you know, do what feels good. There wasn't like measurements. They're like, you know, just keep trying until, until it comes out the way that you like it. But always as you're preparing these foods and as you're harvesting, give offerings, give prayer, do things with the consciousness that what you're doing is sacred and what the product is, is going to be nourishing and gifting wellness and wholeness and happiness to the people who partake of that. And, and I think that that just encapsulates so much how, how like both the role of, of, of women and our matriarchs in our society and what has, what um, heteropatriarchy has tried to take away from us. I will never give them credit for taking it away from us because they didn't, but they have tried to take it away from us. Um, and, and they've created a lot of problems and a lot of challenges in the process um, that, that we have to confront and navigate in order to fully restore and reclaim those life ways. Um, but uh, the, those generations of hardships did not create did not create a society and community of victims. It created a society and community of warriors. And I mean, real warriors, you know, like, um, not the, like, like, like what Hazel was describing, like warriors aren't, aren't just people who put their bodies on the front lines. Warriors are those who do caretake for the community. Warriors are those who love the hardest. The warriors are those who, who take that responsibility every day to take care of life all around them. Um, and that means everything from cooking, from growing foods, from planting seeds, to harvesting, uh, to teaching our young ones, to protecting them and, and reminding them what sacred beings they are. And so when we talk about matriarchy and rematriation, it really is about, um, you know, undoing a lot of a lot of the conditions that have been created by heteropatriarchy and restoring the rightful role and the respect for those roles of our, our femmes and our women. And everyone has a role in that. Um, we're, we're really reclaiming the wholeness of our collective. Um, and and that, that's what, you know, is so beautiful about Carlos and his work and everything that they're doing in the recipe book that they, that they're putting out there because it's a step in that direction. It's, it's, it's almost like a through food, relearning what those ways are. Right. Um, and like, like Hazel described when she was talking about the importance of, of prayer and of taking care of these, um, uh, are carrying out these practices with discipline and consistency. It's, it's how we stay balanced, not only as individuals, but as communities so that we can begin to have build, so we can build the foundation to, to create new communities, to create new social structures, um, to reclaim our cultural life ways, our traditional life ways, so that we have real alternatives to capitalism to the, the, the systems of power and decision-making that are taking us further away from ourselves and all that is sacred. Um, and, and we just like, you know, we make them, we render them irrelevant and we create our own pathways forward and reshape our future as our communities, reimagining, you know, uh, the, 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 the destinies of our people. Um, and so like, um, you know, part of that is recognizing the interlinkages between these things, because we can't talk about doing this stuff. We can't talk about rematriation or even food sovereignty without, we don't, as indigenous peoples, we don't have the, the privilege to pick and choose our battles or our solutions. Um, we can't talk about any of these things without addressing the epidemic of violence against our indigenous women, our two-spirit, our LGBTQIA relatives, our um, our children and our elderly. 
And so, um, you know, working against this is, is the responsibility of everyone because it's heteronormative patriarchy and the power structures that it's created um, that have gotten us to this position, that have, that have colonized our ways of loving that have took and, and, and affected every single person on this planet um, in, in that way. We have forgotten ourselves. We have forgotten our roles. We have forgotten our sacred responsibilities, or at least a large majority have. But this, these are the very things that Indigenous peoples are fighting for and are reclaiming and are rebuilding in very beautiful ways. Um, you know, like... Um, when we're when we're understanding this, when we when we understand, you know, what it is that we're fighting for, and that role that love plays in in restoring our matriarchies and rematriating our communities to these sacred life ways, we understand that it's not about you know. Um, women getting a leg up over the other are about taking away the roles from men, um, but really about remembering that everyone, every gender has that role and responsibility in building the wholeness of our communities. And that uh, when we can hold each other in, in reclaiming and finding those pathways to do that, that's how we change the paradigms that we're under. That's how we shift power. That's how we build the, the type of collective power that brings brings that life back to our earth that that um, gives back more than we take because that's our definition of sustainability it's not you know like like make these systems sustainable or <laughs> are, are produce just enough to like you know feed our population but it's about giving back more to all all sacred life that were that's around us and respect of our our um relationships and the reciprocity that is underneath it and respect that what our roles as human is not to um, as humans is not to um, use earth as a resource, but to understand that we're part of a larger interconnected web of life in which we, we can be, uh, considered completely insignificant, you know, like, um, you know, with the, all the conversations and work around climate change that we're doing, um, there, there tends to be this translation of white saviorism and climate change. Like we need to save the earth. <laughs> the earth isn't going anywhere you know we're destroying a lot of things we're disrupting a lot of sacred balances but the earth will be here long after we have destroyed ourselves and it will it will reclaim it will rebuild it will heal because it lives on a different time scale than we do and like when we recognize that we recognize and take responsibility for our insignificance and also for the for our responsibility to act um, for our own preservation, um, for our own our own well being, our own wholeness, um, and so one of the, like you know uh, thinking about all the different roles that people have in this process, um, I'm so grateful to Carlos and his work because Carlos is teaching my little boy, my son, and my daughter. Um, how to forage, you know, and they're learning so much. Like they're not just learning this from me, uh, but they're learning it from 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 men like Carlos who are out there doing this doing this work to restore this sacred relationship to the earth and in ways that I can't teach them. And that's so beautiful. That's so powerful. And it's the same with the roles of our, our grandmothers. You know, Hazel is constantly inviting us to ceremony and helping our children learn these things because we all have this responsibility in this role um, to, to restore our communities. Uh, two of the most important lessons that, um, you know, I've learned throughout this work um, that have been told to me over and over again by, by some of our, our most, uh, our greatest warriors and elders that have been working on the front lines for so long um, is that the greatest act of resistance that you can do is to keep planting. Because when you're, when you continue to plant uh, you're you're committing to that responsibility to raise that sacred plant to that to raise those sacred foods through its life cycle. You're committing to that sacred responsibility to honor that relationship and that responsibility to Earth every day, uh, and and you're committing to that responsibility to feed and take care of your loved ones and your communities all around you. And so that's one of the lessons. The other lessons is that um, the other lesson is that. Um, you know, um, uh, there, there's no, uh, there's no greater act of resistance than to learn how to re than to relearn how to love, and how to be and walk in love. 
And, you know, that's kind of scary to say in the Western world because they like, like, look at you like you're some crazy hippie because they have colonized all of our different ways of understanding love. But when you really think about it and understand it from the way that it's been spoken and held here by Carlos and by Hazel and like, like what that actually looks like and means, uh, you understand how and why it's so revolutionary and how and why it has the power to shift entire consciousness as well as uh, ways of living. And, and I think that that's, that's at the core and at the heart of what the indigenous rights movement here uh, across our continent, but also across the globe uh, really represents is that it's that call to action to, to act from that place of love, to restore our, our ways of loving and of, and of being connected and of living in sacred responsibility with all of life. And so uh, I guess I'll end it there, but I, these guys got me all fired up um, and I'm, it's just an honor and a joy to be here with them. Wow, sis, I always appreciate hearing you speak and I've never heard that before in all of my days visiting Native nations all across the country and beyond. Um, I've never heard it articulated in that way that one of the greatest resistance is to relearn how to love. Um, of course I see it because all indigenous peoples are embodying that teaching in different ways, but I've never heard it spoken like that. Um, and also the greatest resistance, the other greatest resistance is to keep planting. Um, and I think that's really germane and, and perfect for this podcast, which is solutions oriented, um, that, that it's about the things we build. And, and I love that idea of making these colonial systems obsolete and that with the little Colorado Watershed Chapters Association, creating our own governance structures, even in the face of BIA, even in the face of the Navajo uh, Council Chambers, which is basically our puppet government, right? Even in the face of um, all of these systems that were imposed on us and are technically the authority of governance for you to bring about this, this different way of relating to each other and, and, and ruling, I guess, or not ruling, but uh, governing uh, through indigenous matriarchy, through indigenous kinship. Um, I love that idea of rendering these colonial systems obsolete. Um, and and through, through relearning how to love and through continuing to plant, I think we do that too because it's about creating those things we love, creating those things that are going to work instead of constantly fighting against the systems that don't. And don't get me wrong, that has its time and place for sure. But um, when I was going to apply to Harvard Business School, um, my elders were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they said, um, you know, I, I was like, yeah, I'm going to destroy capitalism from the inside out. You know, because you went to Ivy League, Janine, in Columbia, and I went to Stanford. So I was always trained to, to, to engage with power structures to change the world. But my elders said, you could swing the pendulum from the inside as, as, as a Harvard Business School student. You could swing the pendulum from the outside as a protester. Or they said, you can build your own pendulum and step outside of that swinging back and forth altogether. And so I just really appreciate uh, the, the the ideas that you're bringing and the ways that you uh, the ways that you affect our community in such a in such a beautiful way. And so just so everyone knows, uh, Janine's uh, business is Sixth World Solutions. That's sixth-world.com. They work on food sovereignty, water security, sustainable housing, and in the energy landscape and really re revamping our, our energy systems. Um, and I just real quick want to ask a follow-up question, Janine, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, why did you name it the Sixth World Solutions? Why did you name your business that? Ah, good question. Uh, you know, I was looking back at our oral histories and our emergence through different worlds. And when we're talking about what we're up against and what we're trying to create, we really wanted to envision thinking seven generations out and beyond. And so a lot of our work is taken, uh, is done with that approach of like looking beyond, you know, like even uh, beyond seven generations to the creation of new worlds um, so that we can plant those seeds now and anything that we're doing, any project, any solution, any program uh, needs to be done with the intention of planting those seeds that's going to create the world that we want to we want our unborn to inherit 
Thank you all so much. I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm going to go ahead and end with a little poem uh, just to, to uh, end us. And Carlos, thank you so much for sharing about your cookbook and the iCollective's cookbook. Please check it out, iCollectiveInc.org. Um, and it's just an incredible multimedia, multifaceted little universe, you know, talking much more than just how to make foods. And thank you so much, uh, Hazel, for, Shema, for, for sharing with us these really important teachings that, you know, that only you could give us out of us for here with your longstanding, you know, experience as our elder and your connection to other elders. And Janine, thank you so much as always for, you know, giving us a blueprint of how to be on this world and, and the beautiful teachings that you've picked up. So since we've talked about, you know, matriarchy and, you know, and that's not always a given in the world, obviously, uh, as Danette people were kind of like, oh yeah, matriarchy, duh, women lead, but that's not necessarily how other people think around the world. It's actually the opposite of like, of course, the man is the man of the house. And of course, the man leads the wife. And of course, the men do make all the decisions, but, but that we want to challenge that here today on this episode. We want to invite people to really question if that's an assumption we should be making. And if we are truly here to support the next seven generations of children to come, perhaps we should be speaking with the mothers of those children. They have an intuitive, intimate, uh, innate connection to the needs of the children and if we want to survive and thrive into the future, perhaps we should be consulting with the mothers and having them lead the way. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so this poem is a little, um, a little uh, ode to, to, to matriarchy. That beautiful pumping heart is the needle of her compass body, guided by something unseen, yet powerfully alive in everything. From her eyes shoot light beams that see things yet to come into being. Vision, prayer, and lightning in her veins. She is a woman. She is a warrior. She is a soldier of an ancient battle. The tip of the spear of the work of a thousand ancestors. Her grandmother may have wore moccasins. She might wear high heels. But the war is the same. For us to create a home for native nations, living like refugees in our own lands. The world may see us as nothing, but we know indigenous peoples are the antidote to the earth's decay. She knows that we are the antidote to the earth's decay. And the power and strength of her needle heart inside of that compass body will fight to ensure our future generations live to grow another day. Thank you everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. Have a beautiful night. And thank you so much for taking the time to, to give us all these beautiful words. 